starting a new book today, 1 Peter. So as you're turning to 1 Peter, let's, uh, let's open up with prayer. Lord, we're just so thankful to be in your presence this morning and so thankful that we have the freedom to worship you, to open up your word and and to glean from it what you would give us, Lord. And just pray that our ears would op- be open, our eyes would be open, Lord, and in tune with your Spirit as you speak to us, and that, Lord, we would leave here changed, and we would not be the same, and that you would continue to do your work in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. First Peter chapter 1. Got a lot of people away this morning. Where is everybody? It's all right. You can tell them what they missed next week. So James was a good book, wasn't it? Man. It was challenging teaching through James. Still got the marks. So we're on to 1 Peter. It starts off with verse 1. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who were elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. So like we do anytime we start off a new book, we like to understand a little bit of the background, the who, the where, the what, the why. And, And so we start off this letter from Peter, With who? Who's it from? This is Peter, who was an apostle, a fisherman turned disciple, turned apostle. And you notice as he writes this, and and in his letters, he really doesn't do a lot like Paul does to justify who he is in, in, in his apostleship. You know, Paul seemed to really have to work at it because he kind of came in later. You know, he kind of, he even referred to it as being someone untimely born. And Peter doesn't really have to do that. He, he's like, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. He puts it right out there. Paul was impul- Peter was impulsive. If you think about him through the Gospels, he was a leader. He was passionate. He was in the inner sanctum with Jesus. Remember, when Jesus would go away or go into a special place, he would always include Peter. It's usually Peter, James, and John. Those are the three that were generally in the inner sanctum with Jesus. So that's a little bit about what Peter was. And now, who's the letter to? Who is this letter written to? And it says it right here in the first verse. It's to the elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So really, this is the northernmost region of what is now Turkey. And, And Peter is writing this what he calls the dispersion, and he refers to them as the elect exiles. The Greek, it really talks about dispersed sojourners in that neat region north of the Taurus Mountains up there. It'll be clear as we go through this letter that it was written mainly to Gentiles. And if I were to read that, just from reading it, elect exiles of the dispersion, that would kind of talk to me about Jews who had been dispersed from Jerusalem. But this is written to more than Jews. This is written, you take those words mainly as people who are sojourners, who are not from that region, who do, who do not have citizenship in that region, much, much like us, right? Our citizenship isn't of this region, it's, it's in heaven. And we're sojourners through this life. Where was it written from? We'll find out in chapter 5 that it's most likely it was written from Rome. Paul refers to Babylon in in verse 13 of chapter 5. He said those in Babylon send their greetings. And in those writings in that time, Babylon was often a reference to Rome. And so many think that he was in Rome at the time of this writing. And when was it written? Most likely it was written around A.D. 62 or 63. Just before the persecution broke out under Nero, and about five years before the execution of Paul. And the last question we want to ask ourselves is why? What was the purpose of this letter? 
During this time, persecution was going out, was, was going on throughout all of the Roman Empire. And it was about to get turned up even more severely under Nero. If you are aware of history, Nero burned Rome and then blamed the Christians. And it was all over after that. Millions of Christians were martyred during that era of persecution. And even as Peter was writing this letter, persecution was rampant. And so the theme of, of this letter is for those who are undergoing that persecution to persevere in the faith. Persevere in the faith while suffering that per- persecution and be full of living hope. You'll see those words as we, as we keep reading. Be full of a living hope as you're going through that hard time. A living hope for the present. That God will supply every need. And a living hope for the future. Which is the salvation of our souls. That's what we look to. That's what gives us hope. That's the outcome of our faith. As you look at the leading apostles who gave us the bulk of the New Testament writings, who do you think of? We think of Peter, we think of Paul, and we think of John, right? As we look through the New Testament, the bulk of the apostles that gave authorship, their authorship to the New Testament were Peter, Paul, and John. John Corson writes about them. It's very interesting if you look at the themes that they represent, that they really speak about in the New Testament. If you look at their writings, what the Holy Spirit chose to communicate them, Paul was the apostle of faith. Right? Paul was the one that articulates more clearly than any other writer about the justification by faith. So we associate Paul with being justified by faith. Paul is the writer of faith. Peter was the apostle of hope. More than anyone else, Peter stresses hope as the answer to persecution and difficulty. Keep that hope. And John, we all know John. John was the apostle apostle of what? Love. So how cool is that? You think about These apostles that went on to write the bulk of the New Testament, think what they represented. Faith, hope, and love. How cool is that? So it's amazing that how the Holy Spirit weaves all of this together. And now as we're going through Peter, we're going to hear more about hope. And he makes his opening address in verse 1, identifying himself and his audience, and then he goes on to verse 2, and he says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. So he writes to those who are the elect according to three things, right? And the three things are the foreknowledge of God the Father, the sanctification of the Spirit, and for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood. So we go back to the word elect. What is that? Those who are called according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. He writes to the elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. God isn't surprised when someone surrenders to His love, is He? It doesn't catch him by surprise. He doesn't go, whoa, I didn't see that coming. God is omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's all-knowing. He's outside of time. He can see from beginning to end. While we're kind of on this linear path, he's got a, a totally different perspective. He's outside of time. So there's this aspect of foreknowledge. He knows what's going to happen. Nothing takes him by surprise. And there's also this aspect of the elect, those who are called, those who are chosen, that, are, that is being talked about here. And then he goes on to talk about the sanctification of the Spirit. So what's sanctification? What does that mean to us? Sanctification really means the process of becoming holy and set apart. The process of sanctification is becoming holy and set apart for the work of the Lord. 
as we follow the Lord on this journey, as we are sojourning with the Lord, the Holy Spirit is sanctifying us daily, isn't he? Every day, we continue to be sanctified through his work. He points out things in our lives that need to be surrendered. At least that's what he does for me. He continues daily and monthly, yearly, continues to point little things out in my life that I just need to, I just need to let go of. These things just need to be surrendered. They need to be crucified. And there are things that perhaps a year or two ago weren't an issue for me. They, they weren't really something that needed to be dealt with at that time. But right now, as I continue to be sanctified, this thing is in my way. It's an obstacle for me. And the Holy Spirit points out to me and He says, I want that. I need that out of your life. As we allow Him into more and more of our life, to take residence of more and more, we open up more rooms and more doors to Him within our heart, holding nothing back. More of that stuff comes to the surface, doesn't it? More of that stuff gets cleaned out. It's like he's in our hearts and in our souls doing some housekeeping. housekeeping. He's kind of open up that closet. And he's going, whoa, dude. And so he starts going through that closet and stuff that's in there, and he's like, whoa, this has got to go. And we're like, oh, I've really gotten used to that. That's something that I've really kind of held on to all my life, and that's not something that's easy for me to let go. And, and he says, you've got to give it up. And sometimes we wrestle with him. And he'll let it go for a while. He'll let us keep it for a while. But he's going to keep us, keep it right there on our radar screen, doesn't he? He kind of keeps it right there. I, I try to avoid it. I try to keep it out of my peripheral vision, but it's always there, nagging me, that it needs to be dealt with. And then I try to rationalize it. It's just a little thing. It doesn't really hurt anybody. It's fine. And the Holy Spirit just waits us out, doesn't he? Just waits us out. And often, sometimes he's, he withholds blessing. He may Keep a door closed until that thing is dealt with in our life. Until we finally just surrender it. Say, you've got it. And then the blessing comes. And sometimes that's when the time that He opens the door and we can proceed through and go on to that next step in our journey, to that next season. Because we're now ready for it. We're now willing to surrender that one thing that we were holding on to. I've, I've been through it. I know what I'm talking about. And so when he tells us to let something go, we might as well do it, right? Because you're going to have to eventually let it go anyway. And we might as well save ourselves a lot of unnecessary pain. So after being on this journey for some time now and earning every one of these gray hairs that I've got, arguing with God is not something that I would recommend. Just let it go. If you put something on your heart, just surrender it. Let it go. It's not worth it. Nothing is worth it. So back to our text. Again, this is according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, the sanctification of the Spirit. And thirdly, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood. Peter here reinforces the Trinity, doesn't he? You see these three things. Foreknowledge of God the Father, sanctification of the Spirit, obedience to Jesus Christ reinforcing the Trinity. People argue with you about the Trinity. You can point them right here to James chapter 1. I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm still in James, man. You can point them to 1 Peter chapter 1 and say, look it. It's all right here. These three persons of the Trinity, they're all distinct and yet they're one. They are God. And so this third one that Peter mentions... Jesus Christ. So what about Jesus Christ does he reference? He references obedience. He references obedience to Jesus Christ. And 
That's not often the reference that we hear when it comes to Jesus Christ. Very often we hear more about having faith in Jesus Christ, believing in Jesus Christ, or accepting Jesus Christ. But Peter here points to something else. Obedience to Jesus Christ. We don't hear a lot about obedience to Jesus Christ. What about the Great Commission? You know, when, you, when you rattle off those words back in Matthew 28, with the Great Commission, what do we think about? I know what I think about. If we think about what is that last thing that he said to his disciples, if you turn to Matthew 28, 19 to 20, we see it says, Go therefore. Jesus said to his disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Another reference to the Trinity. So that's chapter, that's verse 19. But what about verse 20? Teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. That's the second thing he tells them to do, right? Go, make disciples, baptizing them, but also to teach them all these things that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Go, make disciples, baptize them. That element of baptism, we're going to be having a baptism coming up as a sign-up sheet, is an element of obedience talked about it Friday night with the teens. It's not something that's required for salvation, but it's something that was taught. Jesus himself was baptized by John. And Jesus commanded here in Matthew to go make disciples and baptize them. This baptism is an outward symbol of an inward change that takes place. It symbolizes as we go under the water our death as Jesus died on the cross. And it symbolizes His resurrection as we come back out, uh, out of the water. It's an outward display. It's an outward testimony to others of what Jesus has done inside of us. And so if you haven't been baptized yet, I would encourage you to do so. We can talk about it if you have any questions about it. So Jesus says, go, make disciples, make followers, baptize them, and then teach them my commands. Help them to be obedient to my commands. Obedience to Jesus Christ, Peter talks about. Following Him, following Jesus, stay with me now, following Him requires obedience. It's not just a walk of faith. That walk of faith requires us to stay with Him and follow Him. And He calls us to be obedient to Him as we make our journey. And that's what Peter is doing in this letter, isn't it? Peter now is, this is 30, at least 30, 35 years after the crucifixion of Jesus. And Peter is still on this journey. He's still doing the work of the Lord. He's still hard at it. He's been through a lot. We read in our home groups, we've been reading in Acts in our home groups over these last few weeks, being thrown in jail. We just read about him being miraculously released while he's chained up to four guards. The angel whip, whacks him on the side and says, get up. Put your clothes on. We're leaving. The gates open up and he's out. He finds himself out in the street. He goes back to his friends. He knocks on the gate. Rhoda comes to the gate and hears his voice. She runs back in the house. She doesn't even believe it. She says, hey, it's Peter. It's his voice. And it's, no, no, it's not his voice. They were, they were busy praying. They didn't even really bother with this guy out on the street. We're praying for Peter. Don't bug us. She's like, no, you don't get it. Peter's out in the street. No, it must be his angel or something. They were pay, praying earnestly, it says in Acts. You wonder how earnestly were they praying because the prayer, they, he's out there, dude. Peter had been through some stuff. And now he's writing this letter to all the believers that are in this region. And, and, and those, those regions that he names off are probably the sequence where this letter would arrive as it was sent out. And he's now, it's a, it's, it's a bit of a different generation now. 30 years have passed. And he's talking about obedience. He's responding to the circumstances of the times, isn't he? 
And what, this, what is the big circumstance of this time? It's persecution. People are getting killed for their faith. People are getting lit up on fire and set up as torches for their faith. Fed to lions for their faith. And Peter's like, hang in there. People are responding to the circumstances that is going on. And in that context, he's helping the followers of Jesus understand Jesus' commands. Jesus' commands are constant. They don't change. And yet the context by which we are living changes over time, doesn't it? And so Peter is interpreting for them how they should be living in that situation. And I think that's a great example for us to follow. We live in interesting times today, don't we? Crazy times. In every generation, the context continues to change. I grew up in the 60s and 70s. Whole different context. Amen? Those of us who remember it, it's a whole different context. It was a whole different worldview back then, wasn't there? And Chuck Smith was one of the ones that recognized that we need to adapt our approach to make disciples to meet the people where they are. Right? He understood it. It was about the Word of God, period. It's about the Word of God. Just laying it out there for them so the Holy Spirit could do the work. But Pastor Chuck spoke those words to a group of people that the church during that time wouldn't even think about going after. The hippies and the druggies, the people who were just spaced out, growing their hair long and their beard and flowers all over their clothes and just spinning around and loving life. And the church at that time was just closing their doors to them. It's like, man, you got to get a haircut. you got to clean yourself up. Get off all that stuff before you even come in here. But Chuck had a heart for those people. And the Holy Spirit led a bunch of people around him. And the response was crazy, right? You read about the history of this movement. The response was just crazy. Thousands coming to the Lord. You see pictures of the beach baptisms that took place and hundreds and hundreds of people there getting baptized, people up on the rocks watching. Pictures in mag- front pages of magazines of this stuff going on. And so new fellowships began to be opened up throughout Southern California. And contemporary Christian music was born. And many people didn't agree with that. But Pastor Chuck had the wisdom to understand that the commands of Jesus, the necessity to be obedient to Jesus, doesn't change. But the context by which we interpret it, how we can communicate to the people around us, it needs to be adaptable and flexible so that people, we meet people where they are. He got that. I think there's something to be learned about that. And I think Peter was doing that in this letter. Because the context that he was writing in was persecution. And so he's going to take the commands of Jesus Christ, which are unchanging, he's going to make them speak to what these people were going through. And that's exactly what we need to do. As we rub shoulders with the people that we work with, that come in contact with at the grocery store, you've got to meet people where they are. That's what Jesus did. And look who he hung out with. It's a great lesson for us. So as Peter did in this letter, in the response to a time of persecution, Calvary Chapel did in the 70s in the time of challenging the old ways of doing things. And we need to do that same thing today in the co- times and culture that we have been planted in. This is the culture that we have been planted in. To meet people where they are and help show them the love of Christ as they deal with a different set of challenges. Again, Jesus never changes The Word of God never changes. But our method of communicating about faith, hope, and love needs to be flexible and adaptable to the times we live in. That's why we have new translations of the Bible. What may have been understandable in the 1600s may not be as effective today. Back in history, many churches wouldn't even think about having a piano or an organ in their sanctuary. Never mind a set of drums and electric guitars and all this stuff. 
We were in the church that my wife and I were married in. Nobody here in this room would have been allowed up on the stage or to be definitely not be sitting here unless you had a jacket and tie on. Times change. We've got to roll with it. So we need to be real to those we live amongst without sacrificing any of our doctrinal stances that are based upon Scripture. Does that make sense? We need to be real, but we need to be true to the Word and true to the doctrine and stand by that. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9 that I become what? All things to all people. That by all means I might save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel. That I may share with them in its blessings. Paul got that. So that's one of the, the lessons I take from this passage is Peter got that too. He understood he needed to deal with this whole thing with persecution. Because he was concerned that they would lose heart. They would give up. And he didn't want them to do. He wanted to understand that they had hope. They had a living hope. And so, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, Peter says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. He mentions the sprinkling of his blood. Why is that? He talked about obedience, and now he mentions the sprinkling of his blood. The reason he mentions that is because we fall short. Because we sin. Peter speaks to the sprinkling of the blood of Christ. That cleanses us from sin. And that's what's so cool about being a follower of Christ. The Father calls us. The Father calls us. The Son shows us how we should then live. But He's also provided a way for us when we fall short, right? He's provided those commands of how we should live, but He's also provided a way for us when we fall short through His blood. And the Holy Spirit encourage us and guides us and loves us along that journey of sanctification. How great is our God? How cool is that? Think about that. The Father calls us. Our Savior shows us the way through His commands and provides for us when we fail. And the Holy Spirit is there to walk with us day by day, sanctifying us, renewing us daily. Nothing in the world can provide that for us. Nothing. That's because we're not citizens of this world. This world has nothing for us. We're just sojourners, just passing through, and we're bringing many, as many of our neighbors and our friends along with us as we can, right? As we're walking through, as we're passing through. This amazing secret has been revealed to us, this good news. There's nothing like it. And the more we let go of the junk the world is offering us and take hold of the things that Jesus is offering us, the more we discover how great our God really is. The more we let go of the junk that the world is offering us and take hold of the things that Jesus is offering us, the more we discover how great our God really is. Jesus said in Matthew 10, he who loses his life for my sake shall what? Find it. It's a paradox. He who loses his life for my sake shall find it. It doesn't make any sense from an earthly mind. You try to explain that to someone logically, it doesn't make any sense. But it makes sense spiritually. And it makes sense from experience, doesn't it? As we go through this life and we're continuing to be sanctified, the more we let go of, the more we lose from our earthly life, the more we find the heavenly life, the spiritual life through Jesus. It makes absolute sense. It's clear as a bell. We're not actually losing anything when we give those things up. But a bunch of headaches and frustrations that in this world, and we're gaining the joy of the Lord. We are gaining faith, hope, and love. That's what we're gaining. We're not losing anything. We're leaving all that junk behind. And we're gaining grace. And we're gaining peace as it multiplies amongst us. That's, that's just, it, it's beyond words. 
That's what Jesus has to offer us. So when he says, pick up your cross and follow me, we need to keep both our hands on that cross. So when we reach down to pick some of that other stuff that we see along the way, that's when we get in trouble. Keep both hands on that cross and follow him. Verse 3. Peter says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's that word blessed mean? We hear it a lot. Bless your heart. If you hear it down south, that's not usually a good thing. Just saying. In this context, this Greek word, and this Greek word is only used of God. This Greek word blessed means worthy of praise, worthy of adoration. Blessed be God, be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's worthy of praise and he's worthy of adoration. He says, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. To be born again. Through the fall of Adam and Eve, when we were born physically, we were born into death. We were born into the fall, right? There was separation between us and the Father, spiritually. But through His great mercy, Peter says, He has provided a way for us to be born a second time. We're born physically into this world. But there's a necessity, as Jean, Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, there's a necessity to be born again, spiritually. To have a second birth. He's provided a way for us to be born a second time to a living hope. And who is that living hope? Jesus Christ. A hope that is alive. This isn't just any hope like we have here on earth. This is a living hope. We don't just do our best and cross our fingers that God might light us into heaven. As some may say, we're not the kind of hope we get into heaven. Our hope is in Christ and Christ alone. Amen? That's where our hope is. And we don't say Christ was. We say Christ is. In the present tense. He's alive. And we can witness in work, His work in our lives as we live out our calling day to day. But people say to us, well, you can't see Him. How do you know he exists? Prove it. And I reply, because I can see his footprints as he leads me through my life. I can see it. And I can see his fingerprints as he molds me and shapes me to become his workmanship and his masterpiece. It's true about all of us. We can see his footprints as He leads us on this journey, and we can see those fingerprints on our lives as He's molding us and shaping us. Me sitting up here today is nothing but a miracle. Any of us being here today is nothing but a miracle. It's a work of God. You can't explain it through logic. It's a spiritual thing. It's an amazing miracle. We can see the work that He does then through us once He saves us. Once we have that second birth, we see the work of God being done through us. Because when I do things on my own, I just make a mess. When I tell God, I've got this one, you're busy, I've got it, it just falls apart, comes unraveled. But when I, I let Him guide my hands and guide my feet, that work brings forth this fruit which can only come apart from God. The fruit that comes as we work in and through the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit works through us, it is so evident that it can only be a work of God. And so we are born again to a living hope, but there's more, it says. 
We have a living hope while we're here on this earth, right? We all share this living hope. We have this hope. But we also have an inheritance that has been laid up for us in heaven. An inheritance that is what? Peter describes it. It's imperishable. That work that Jesus did on the cross in conquering the grave was an eternal work. It's not something temporal or defined by time. It's an inheritance that is undefiled. He was without sin and shed his blood so that as followers of Christ, God the Father views us through his blood as undefiled, right? God can view us as undefiled through the blood of Jesus. He, through our faith in the work of Jesus, views us as righteous. Just like Abraham. Right? Abraham was given, God considered Abraham righteous because of, not his works, but because of his faith. And our inheritance, it says, is unfading. This inheritance, unlike worldly inheritance, we receive a, an inheritance from perhaps our parents or grandparents. That fades. It's gone. But this inheritance is not material. It doesn't fade or corrode. Our inheritance shines like the sun. Revelation 21, 23. It says, And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light. And its lamp is the Lamb. The lamp is the Lamb. Back in 1 Peter 1, chapter, verse 5 now. He says, Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation, ready to be revealed for the last time. So through the power of God, that word power, the dunamis, the dynamite of God, what's that, being, what's that doing? It's guarding the inheritance. It's guarding us through this life. Through what? Through our faith. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith. God is sovereign. And He guards our inheritance and He guards us as we abide in faith. That's what that's saying there. So I don't need to worry that He's going to forget about me. I don't need to worry that He's misspelled my name in the Lamb's book of life somehow. When I get there, he's not going to see, let's see, I see a Charles Woob in here. I don't see a Charles Wood. Are you sure you were a follower? He can yell back to Gabriel, can you check on this guy and check the video, make sure he's, because I, I don't see a Charles Wood here. I can't tell if this is a B or a D. Who wrote this in here? No, my inheritance is guarded by the power of God. But note that it says it's guarded by the power of God through faith. It's guarded by the power of God through faith. So do, God does all of the work. <clears throat> and that work that came at such a great price. To provide a way out. Right? That rescue plan. To provide a means of being redeemed. And what does he ask of us? What does God ask of us? All he asks of us is to have faith that he is who he says he is and will do what he promised to do. That's it. We have to have faith. So God does all this work providing this way, sending his son to die for us. He's provided this way out and all we have to do is to have faith, to have faith in him. To have faith in who He is and who he, what He will do. That He sent His Son to die for our sins and He raised Him from the dead and now we have a way out. Not only that, what's so amazing is I know in my life and I'm, I'm sure in many of your, your lives up until that point where I made that decision, I, I relented. He pursued me. 
He pursued me relentlessly. He loves us so much that He continues to be there at every turn through the Holy Spirit, inviting us into a relationship with Him. Amen? And many of us fight it and put Him off, and still He pursues us. Still He's there calling us to Him. And I know in my case, I just kept, yeah, what, yeah, yeah. Many of us get to a point where we're actually at our rock bottom. Some of us, it takes us to the point where we're actually at the complete and absolute end of ourselves until we can finally look up and say yes. We can finally consent to be loved. That's all he asks. All he asks from us is to consent to be loved. It's simple. And so we surrender. We surrender what, whatever it was we were running to, the thought that would bring us peace. We surrender that and we surrender to him because he does provide peace. And we find that out. And he fills that void that We've been trying to fill with other stuff and we realize that it was Him we needed all along. And so, that's why we call it being born again. It's a whole new life. Right? New creation. And now we have a living hope. So amazing. An inheritance waiting for us. Eternity with Him in heaven. So not only do we have a new life on earth that is incomparable to what we were experiencing before, but now we get to look forward to a heavenly realm. Eternity with our Father in heaven and His Son and the Holy Spirit. He simply asks us to abide in that faith and continue to follow Him. He does all the work And we're simply asked to abide. Turn to John 15, verses 5 to 7. Jesus talks about this. Jesus uses such great analogies in his parables that explain it so clearly. This whole aspect of abiding in him. John 15, verse 5, he says, I am the vine. Jesus is the vine. The the vine where the life is going through. You are the branches that come out from the vine. Whoever abides in me, whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. We just talked about that. In myself I can do nothing. In ourselves we can do nothing of ourselves. The fruit just doesn't happen. But when we abide in Him, when our branch is attached to Him and we are in Him and He is in us, it produces fruit. It's crazy. But it's amazing. He says, He it is that bears much fruit, for apart from Me you can do nothing. Verse 6, it says, If anyone does not abide in Me, he is thrown away. Like a branch. And the branch withers. And those branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. Verse 7, But if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. So Jesus gives this analogy of the vine and the branch. And he asks us to abide, because that's where we need to be. We need to continue to abide with him. So as we realize that we needed him, It's just not raising our hand and coming forward and say, yes, Lord, I I need you. And then we just go back to our life. It's not how it works. We can't just attach ourselves to the vine and then unattach ourselves again and think it's, it's all good. We need to abide, Jesus says. Because it's only through Him that we produce fruit. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you, He says. If you don't abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. 
So again, Peter says, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So we have a salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. I don't probably spend enough time thinking about that. About that last time about heaven. Because I don't think, I, I can't wrap my mind around it. When all of this comes to an end, when all the events described in Scripture have come to their completion and we're home. Think about it. No longer sojourning. As Peter was addressing this to these people that are being persecuted. Think about why he's writing this stuff. Ready to be revealed in the last time. He's, he's showing them what is to come. Not only the living hope while we're here, but the living hope of eternity with him. When we're no longer sojourning, we're home where we belong. Turn to Romans 8. Romans chapter 8, Paul is writing about this whole aspect of still being here on this earth, but knowing that we have a heavenly home. Verse 22 to 24, just the first part of 24. Romans chapter 8. And Paul writes to the Romans in verse 22, he says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. The whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we await eagerly for adoption as sons. We're eagerly waiting for that. The redemption of our bodies. In the first part of verse 24, it says, For in this hope, we were saved. Paul got this. He got it. Because he went through some stuff while he was here too. And I'm sure he groaned as we all groan. It's tough down here. Peter is telling us through the Holy Spirit that we, we need to keep our hope. We have a living hope. Think about that salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. We have a home that's so amazing. A home that we're going to that's so amazing, Paul couldn't even put it into words. Paul got to experience that in a vision. He's like, men can't even talk about that stuff. John Dot tried to describe it in Revelation, but he could only do so in, in using his own human intellect. And in only the simple words by which we can describe things. John tried to describe it. He, he couldn't do it justice. We can't even wrap our minds around it. Sometimes I, I walk out my back door of my house, I take the dog out at night, and I look up. And I see the stars, the heavens, and my head explodes. Because I can't even fathom it, you know? I can't even fathom what heaven's going to be like. I can't wrap my mind around what's out there. And I can't wrap my mind about what's in store for us. And I can't, certainly can't even imagine what the Lord has been preparing for us. So remember he says, I go to prepare a place for you. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? He's been working a long time. I can't wait. But as Paul said, live as Christ to die as gain. While we're here, we're going to be about his business. But in the last times, we're going to go be with our Lord at home. All I know about what is to come is that we will be home. We will be home. We will be home with the one who formed us in our mother's womb. Right? Right? The one who made a way for us to be with him when this brief stint on this planet is over. We're going to be at home with him. The one who loved us so much to pursue us. Who was it, Tozer, that described him as the hound of heaven? That loved us so much to go send his son to the cross for us. To give his spirit to be with us day after day and sanctifying us and being there when we stumble, we mess up and we go off the, the narrow path. 
get to go be home with him, the one that loved us so much. And those of us who have been born again, we've experienced that second birth, we found that way home. Right? We found that way home. It was right there in front of us the whole time. We didn't know it until someone showed us. That's the way God works. He uses people like us to show people the way home. It doesn't make any sense to me because I'm not a good person. I'm not good at that. But yet that's what He asks us to do. We may stumble in it. We may do it haltingly. We don't do it with maybe as good as some other people do. But through the Holy Spirit, He uses us to plant seeds in people's lives to show them the way home. To tell them about the good news. That's all he asks us to do. To share what he, your testimony. Remember we talked about this. All you, all you, the best thing you can do is tell people what he's done in your life. Because they can't debate with that. They can debate with a lot of philosophical, theological things, but they can't debate with what God has done in your life. That's your testimony. We found our way home. And now we get to show others the way home. That's a privilege. That's an honor that our Lord has entrusted to us. We get to participate in that great commission that Jesus gave before he went home, right? Go, make disciples, baptize them, and teach them to observe all that I commanded. There is nothing more important or more fulfilling that we can do with our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to take this time now as we spend some time in this passage, Lord, that you gave to Peter. Peter who was not perfect. Peter, who stumbled big time. And yet, what is so cool is through Peter, who is so much like us, you did an amazing work. You revealed yourself to him. You called him out of his fishing boat. You gave him new life. You transformed him into a new creation. And you took someone who was a regular person, a regular guy, just like us. And through your work, you turned him into somebody that was used mightily by you to make a difference for your kingdom. And so he's home with you now. And Lord, now it's our turn. It's our generation. You've planted us in this time to take your word and to take your commands and to communicate them in a thoughtful way to the culture that we're in today. Not watering it down. Not lessening it in any way. But to make it real to the people we hang out with every day. Whether at work. or at home. or in our neighborhood. And so, Lord, like Peter, we just want to show them the way home. We just want to be used by you. We want to be transformed and sanctified by you day by day. We want to see your work go out from this place into this city of Savannah, into this region of Georgia, southeastern United States, and all around the world. For we are just a a small group here in, in Savannah right now, Lord. But you took 11 guys and changed the world. So, Lord, change us this morning so that we can be used to change the world as well. And we'll give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll read over here.